Hey everyone, welcome to part two of the lecture to help you out with the study guide for unit two. So we already started this uh, last Friday and this is a continuation of that. So if you look at your study guide, we left off right here at question number eight, part C. And since this is all in nice color, I think it might help if you actually watch this video. So first we have to classify each of these as being a substance or a mixture. And then if it's a substance, we have to say if it's an element or compound. And if it's a mixture, we have to say if it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. So first look inside of box C and determine, does everything in box C look the same? Quick answer is no. I see two different particles in there. Second question, if it's not all the same, that means it's a mixture. And now we have to identify it as being homogeneous or heterogeneous. So you have to kind of look at the picture and if you see any clumping or layers, that would be heterogeneous. And if you can't really tell if there's any clumping or layers, it's probably going to be a best bet to call it homogeneous. So looking at this picture right here, I don't really see any kind of clumping or layering. So I'm calling this guy homogeneous. And then part D, do you guys see the big difference there? You can kind of tell in this picture, first of all, there's two different things because they're two different colors and that makes it a mixture. And I hope you guys can see the obvious clumping of material. That would make this a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, question number nine. What state of matter do each of the following diagrams represent? And please justify your answer. So in part A, we see kind of like a geometric set composition. It kind of looks like a crystalline structure. So this would be a solid. And you can justify that by saying that the atoms are very close together, well organized in a packed kind of, um, uh, it's, it's well packed. Um, I'm going to skip over to C. In C, it doesn't look like we have any organization anymore. It doesn't look like we have that beautifully packed container. So I would say in part C that this would be a liquid because it's not well packed and it's not very well organized. And then in part B, it should be obvious that what you see is a gas because the atoms are very well spread out, very well spread apart. Okay, in the next question it says explain the law of conservation of mass. The best way and kind of the shortest way to explain that is just to say that the mass of the reactants have to equal the mass of the products in any chemical reaction. Matter cannot be created nor destroyed in any chemical reaction. Question number 11. In the complete reaction of this much sodium and that much chlorine, what mass of sodium chloride is formed? And it says show all work. So I'm going to pull this off to the side here. All right. Now I hope you guys are starting to get a little bit better acquainted with the periodic table and you do realize that sodium is an element and so is chlorine. All right, so if both of these are elements, um, if you want to figure out the mass of the product, you kind of have to combine these two masses. So we're going to add those up. 22.99 plus 35.45. The total mass of the compound is going to be 58.44 grams. Okay, next question. A 12.2 gram of X reacts with a sample of Y to form 78.9 grams of XY. What is the mass of the Y that reacted? All right. So this time it says that this X stuff reacts with Y. So that means X reacts with Y to form or to make on the product side XY. Now it looks like we have enough information of X. We have 12.2 grams. And it looks like we have a lot of information about this guy, XY. We have 78.9 grams. You'll notice that the product is larger than 12.2. The mass here is larger than that. So we kind of need to know what this missing piece is. And remember, the mass of the reactants should equal the mass of the products. So to figure out that missing piece, all we have to do is subtract 78.9 minus 12.2. I get 66.7 grams. Final answer. Thirteen, describe the structure of a typical atom. Identify where each of the subatomic particles are located. All right, the center of the atom is what we call the nucleus. 
and the nucleus has two different particles located inside. One of the particles is called a proton, and protons are positively charged. The other particle inside of the nucleus is called a neutron, and neutrons are neutral. Oops, that's a zero. Spinning around the outside of the nucleus are these other things, these negative guys, and they're really, really small. Those are called electrons. And electrons are negative. Most of the mass of the atom comes from the center of the atom called the nucleus. So the two particles located inside of the nucleus make up most of the mass of the atom. So the thing that you have to remember is that neutrons have a mass of about 1 AMU. Protons also have a mass of about 1 AMU. But electrons are really small. They are a fraction of an AMU, and since it takes about 2,000 electrons to equal the mass of a proton, we call it a fraction of an AMU. Technically, it's about 2,000, but we're going to call it what it is. It's actually 1,840. And so you'll notice that it's 1 over 1,840. AMUs. It would take 1,840 electrons to equal the mass of a proton. Describe the separation technique that could be used to separate the following mixture. First example is two colorless liquids with two different boiling points. The separation technique there is distillation. If we had a mixture of sand and water, sand is, well, pretty big. Water the particle there is not so big. It's really small. So the best way to separate this mixture would be through filtration. The sand would get caught on the top and the water would pass through the bottom. The last example says two substances that form a heterogeneous suspension. A suspension is where you see a layer. So this typically happens whenever you have a solid mixed with like a liquid. This would be another great filtration. So I would say filtration would be the best technique on this one. 15. Classify each of the following as a chemical or physical property. Chemical properties, they change the overall identity of the substance. Physical properties do not. Iron and oxygen form rust. The formation of rust is actually a chemical process because it makes something called iron oxide. Iron oxide is different than iron. It is a new compound, and since you're forming a totally different compound, that would be a chemical reaction. And so that, for therefore, is a chemical property. Next one. Iron is more dense than aluminum. If you measure the density of iron, would you have to change the substance in any way? You could easily weigh its mass. You could also easily determine its volume. Those type of measurements can be made without actually changing iron's identity. So that is a physical property. Magnesium burns brightly when ignited. Anytime you see the keyword burning, burning is a chemical process. Pretend like you're burning a log of wood. When you burn it, the wood turns into ash. Would you ever be able to get the original wood back? No. Once it's burnt, it's gone it's changed into something totally different. Next example. Oil and water do not mix. Oil will actually float on top of water. Here's a good question. Is oil still oil when it sits on the top of water? And is water still water when it's down on the bottom? Yes. It doesn't change its identity, so that would be a physical property. And technically, anything that floats on top of something else has a different density, remember? And density, like we just said up here in part B, density is a physical property. Last one. Mercury melts at negative 39 degrees Celsius. When it melts, is it still mercury? Yes. And if it hasn't changed its identity, that would be another physical property. Because it's still mercury, it just melted. Number 16. Classify each sample as a physical or chemical change. Crushing an aluminum can. Simple question. Is it still an aluminum can if it's crushed? Is it still made of aluminum? Yeah? That's a physical change. Part B. Aluminum combining with oxygen to form aluminum oxide. 
It sounds like it's making something new, aluminum oxide. That would be a chemical change. Leaves changing color. It is fall after all. I had to put this question on there. Guys, some indications of a chemical reaction would be emission of light or absorption of heat, changing of color, emission of um, smoke or bubbling, like a, like, a, like a chemical reaction that produces a gas. So yes, changing color is actually a sign of a chemical reaction. And the chlorophyll inside of a leaf actually undergoes a overall metamorphosis and it stops making the um, green chlorophyll. So um, it's, it's interesting. So yeah, it's a chemical process. Sugar dissolving in water. Quick question, is it still sugar and is it still water? Does sugar change into something different? No, it just dissolves. It still tastes like sugar, right? Yep, that is a physical change. It's a dissolving. Dissolving is a physical thing. Baking a cake. Students love to debate this one with me. Could you, after you bake the cake, could you ever get the eggs back? Could you ever get the yeast back? Could you ever get the flour back? Eh, not really. Nope, this is done for. It's irreversible, so that's a chemical process. All right, the last three questions are a review of Unit 1. You will have questions from Unit 1 on your Unit 2 test. They're not going to go away. So let's see if you guys can figure out where maybe you had a mental block on Unit 1. All of your Unit 1 tests have been returned to you, so if you ever want to look at those, they're, they should be in your folder files, and it should be returned to you. Maybe you might be able to learn from your mistakes. Let's take a look at number 17. We're going to use the process of dimensional analysis. I want you to notice, first of all, that the first unit is milli and the second unit is kilo. Those are both prefixes. That means in this question, I'm going to do this in two steps, like I taught you in class. We'll start with milligrams. The first jump that I want to do is to go from something with a prefix to something that does not have a prefix, the base unit. You have to follow the one rule. You must cross-cancel your units. So I know I'm going to have to have milligrams on the bottom, but I don't want any prefix on the one on the top. And since I know I'm doing this in two steps, the second step, remember, I want to end with kilograms. Right now, I'm on grams. It's the only unit that is not cross-canceled. So I'm going to do one more step. Always cross-canceling. So here's the basic plan, and now you just need to fill in the proper numbers. Milligrams are really small, so there should be lots of milligrams in one gram. And you just need to think about your King Henry, how many that would be. It's 1,000. Next jump. Kilograms are very large. There should be lots of grams in a kilogram, and you just need to think about how many jumps there are between grams and kilograms. And there are three. Anytime the number is on the denominator, it means that you have to divide. So typing in a number on your calculator in scientific notation, just to review, you would punch it in like this. 8.35, hit your exponent key, then the negative, 6. Since the first number 1000 is on the denominator, you hit divide. The second number is on the denominator as well, and so you hit divide actually twice. Now, metric conversions are kind of cool because you can play around with the powers of 10. What is negative 6 minus 3 minus 3? Did you guys get negative 12? And those are kilograms. Final answer. Make sure you show your work on this problem, otherwise no credit. Number 18. This is another dimensional analysis problem. And if you're wondering what the KS is, K is a lowercase k stands for kilo. It's a symbol for kilo. So you have to go to kiloseconds. We're going to set up this using dimensional analysis. We're starting with years. What would be the next logical step? days. Yep. Notice I'm cross-canceling. What would we do after days? 
hours. Notice how I'm always cross-canceling. Hours to minutes. Minutes to seconds, yeah. And now we're going to do that last little weird thing where it actually isn't asking you for seconds. It's asking you for kiloseconds. So think on the side. Kilo means a thousand. Which one's bigger, kiloseconds or seconds? Well, kilo. Think about kilograms. What if I change it to something different? Kiloseconds are large. Seconds are small. How many jumps are there between a base and kilo? Yep, three. So that'd be a thousand. Here's your here's your uh, conversion factor. Now you just have to plug it in correctly. Looks like we're multiplying until the very end where you have to divide instead. Let's see what we get. All right, I hope I did this right. You guys are going to have to check my math, okay? Do it with me. Did anybody get the same answer as me? Nice, very nice. Okay, um, if you're worried about sig figs, all of these are very precise values. Um, I don't know, maybe stick with two sig figs. So I'd probably say 1.1 .1 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, 6, 8 kiloseconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 